What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the 585 Report. Ryan Sullivan, alongside with me, Mitch Broder. And uh, Ryan, the Bills, they finally, finally get the monkey off their back. They get their first win of the season. And, and it's almost magic, right? Everyone's panicking. Everyone's freaking out, you know, thinking that, that we're overrated and this and that. And then we go and win 35 nothing over the rival Miami Dolphins. And all of a sudden, it's like Bill's Twitter is calm and, and peaceful all again. But uh, anyways, Ryan, but welcome here and uh, good to see you again. It's good to see you. And, and I think calm's a relative term because how spoiled have we become that we're sitting here really kind of tearing apart a 35 to nothing win over Miami that we'll get into wasn't the prettiest of wins, but left a lot to be desired. And, you know, I, I think a lot, a lot of to kind of unpack with this game this week. Absolutely. And I, and I like how you kind of just brought that up because it is kind of unbelievable because if you had asked me before this game had started, Hey, the Buffalo bills are going to win 35 to nothing. I would have been excited. You know, I, I would have taken that every single time. And yet you're right. It, it almost was, you know, a frustrating 35 to nothing win, which sounds crazy to say, but that's kind of how it felt. And I think, Ryan, you can kind of look at it in one of two ways. I think at one, on one hand, you can look at this and say, you know, once again, the passing offense just didn't seem right. Allen just doesn't seem like he's quite clicking like how we saw last year. Um, on the other hand, you can look, look at this, say, you know, the offense struggled a little bit and they still won 35 to nothing over a team that won 10 games a season ago. It's it's really kind of a weird feeling, I guess. I, I don't really know how to like put into words other than that. I mean, I think it all centers around the play of the quarterback right now. Josh, for a second straight week, was not what the Josh that we saw last year. And I think the discussion in the discourse around the team this week is how concerned you are. So, you know, one of the first questions I had, and I'll ask you this, Mitch, if I had to give you on a scale from zero to 10, how concerned are you with what you've seen from Josh Allen and how concerned are you from what you've seen from this offense, even after a, a 35 point victory? So I think um, offense, I'm going to go with a two or a three. I, I, I think we still are seeing the flashes of Brian Dable that we saw last year. For example, that deep ball that Allen hit uh, Emmanuel Sanders on. I mean, that that ball was perfect. And also, that was a great play design to get Sanders motioning uh, across the formation and get him so that the, the DB could not put his hands on him the line of scrimmage. And uh, so you see the glimpses of Dable. I think for me, like the only time this game where I was frustrated with Dable, I, I think it was after um, the Jakeem Grant fumble. They ran it three times in a row, went three and out of punt. It. And for me, like that, I, I hate to see that, especially with the weapons we have. So overall, though, I'm not too concerned about Brian Dable, Josh Allen, I'll put it at a four. And uh, it's not that he's not reading defenses correctly, because I do think he is making the right reads. The thing that's starting to warm me, Ryan, and, and it's something that we didn't see in the preseason is, and this might just be me, but it feels like Josh Allen like is kind of not throwing the ball with that like sheer power that we saw from him a season ago. You know, that deep ball to Diggs that was caught. I mean, that was underthrown. If he puts it on Diggs, Diggs is gone. That's a touchdown. And like, he had a couple throws where, you know, usually he sees them just throw a laser, you know, and instead they're kind of lofting in there. And I, I'm getting concerned, not that Allen is necessarily struggling, that if maybe he's struggling with an injury of some sorts because his he's not throwing the ball with the same kind of zip and, and power that we saw a year ago. Well, and the, the play that stood out to me more than anything was it wasn't one of the high, you know, one of the ones that people highlight that he missed, but it was – in the third or fourth quarter, I don't have a timestamp on it, but you'll you'll probably remember it if I say it, but he was rolling to the left. I think it was when they were up 28 nothing, and they had Sanders coming down the crosser, and he was rolling left with Sanders, and he hit Sanders, had space on his defender, and he just led Sanders too much, where if he had hit him, it would have been probably a 15-yard mm -hmm. gain, and he would have gone out of bounds there. So it's just simple things, but we've seen him make throws this season, right? That gave Davis pass in the Steelers game ridiculous high level throw the Sanders throw high level throw the digs touchdown high you just just everything that you know that quintessential Josh Allen rolling to his left keeping the feet play alive and 
go throwing back across his body. And even the Dawson Knox touchdown was a really, really good throw where he put it where only Dawson Knox can get it. So that's why, I mean, I put it, I'm not concerned with Dable at all. He's you, he is scheming things up the way they need to be schemed up. I think that Steelers game was tough. I think he, he learned from that. He ran a lot less empty sets, a lot more 11 personnel this week. You saw a lot more Dawson Knox in the backfield, a lot more running backs in the backfield. You had guys running open. And so I, I don't think there's any concern with Dable. I think there's a lot of people that harbor resent from, from the 2018 team for some reason and, and are now coming back to life, the uh, Dable truthers. But Dable's fine. Offensive play calling, scheming, but, you know, and it's got on Josh. And I, I put Josh at a three. You know, if, if this trend continues, then then I'll be more concerned. But Josh had bad games last year. Like, I, I think we, you know, there might be coming a point of acceptance where, you know, maybe Josh is just a high variance quarterback and, you know, ceiling is, and his best version of himself is best quarterback, best three quarterbacks of all time. And the floor is the core of the earth. And, you know, if these two games happen in the middle of the season, we probably just shrug our shoulders and move on. And I think because it's the beginning of the season, there's a lot less context and, and, and a lot more, you know, I think just drives a lot more anxiety. Well, that's the thing. I think I think so far this has all kind of been about timing because, you know, the Bills went through that four-game stretch last season where they did struggle, where they lost those two games in a row to Tennessee and Kansas City and then struggled with the Jets and Patriots. Like, you look back at Josh Allen's numbers those four weeks, they were not good. Like, he struggled. He threw some picks. Um, his completion percentage was a little low. And I, I think people didn't panic about that because we had seen the first month of the season Josh Allen playing, at, like you said, at that high level of completing, you know, 65% and up of his passes, throwing 300 yards and three plus touchdowns a game. Like, so I do think that because this is happening right out of the gate, you know, people are panicking a little bit. And then again, that's why I put it at a four. Like I, I look at Josh, I do think he's making the correct reads. I think right. He said his timing just seems to be a little off. You know, his ball placement seems to be a little off, but I, I I'm not concerned that this is going to be Josh Allen all of 2021. I do think he will, bounce back at some point you know I, I have confidence that he will and I think once he puts once he has a good game whether it's you know this week against Washington or it's the next week against Houston once he does have that like typical Josh Allen game I really do think people will start to really calm down a little bit because I just think people need to see it you know we haven't seen it yet uh, and I think once once fans do I think you'll have a you know a chance to kind of take a deep breath here and and, and feel comfortable that the guy who we have a quarterback is you know the guy we saw last season before we talk about, because what I really want to talk about is the defense here, but is there anyone else that stuck out on the offense so far yesterday and through two games that is, has really surprised you and has really stepped up their game from last year? Absolutely. Devin Singletary. I, I'm loving what I'm seeing out of Devin Singletary, and he I think this is the best football he's played maybe in his entire career because, yes, he did put up a lot. You know, He had a couple hundred-yard games his rookie year, but he's producing, and, and he's not doing it off a ton of carries. And the big thing that I got excited about, because we talked about it during the offseason, right? Like, how, how much faster can Singletary really get? Because his knock has been his lack of speed. On that touchdown run, they timed him, I think, at 20.6 miles per hour, which is the fastest time he's ever been clocked at in the NFL. So, or at least in his career, my bad. So, I'm, I'm to see him be explosive. Like, he, I mean, that run, he, he outran DBs to the end zone. Like, I... You know, I, I'm really happy what I've seen out of him. I think he's also looked pretty good as a pass catcher as well. So for me, it, it's been Devin Singletary. I, I really like what I'm seeing from him. I think as of right now, even though the Bills do kind of do that running back by committee approach with him and Moss and occasionally, you know, Brita, I think he is kind of the lead back if you had to pick one at, at this point. The Devin Singletary character arc this season has been hilarious to me because the last taste we had at our mouth of Devin Singletary was him dropping that pass in the AFC championship with 12 yards in front of him on second down or third down, whenever it was. And a lot of people wanting to go out and get a quarter a running back in the first round. And throughout the season, you know, we saw, we know judge posted, you know, love that picture of him all jacked when he was training and had a really good to his credit, really good off, really good preseason look good in camp. And and has put together two really really solid games this year, and you you know you could argue that run uh, in the first quarter was his best run of his career. He had a, that fifty yard run against Denver, but that's when they were already up three scores in that game, and they were they were icing the game. 
he's really we're seeing that 2019 version of him where he's just super hard to bring down. You know, he's not going to blow anyone out of the water, but he's really just that shifty make guys miss, you know, type of back and exactly what, what I think this offense needs. And we're seeing what we talk about, you know, we talked about all off season. It's not about running the ball more with this team. It's running the ball more effectively. And we're running the ball more effectively. If we can get the pass back going again, this is the offense is, is going to skyrocket past whatever we saw last year because of the presence of that run game and those, those you know, those light light boxes that we're going to be able to capitalize on. The only other person that I have in my notes, a guy who's caught a lot of flack over his first two years in Buffalo, Dawson Knox hasn't been flashy through two games, six catches on seven targets and no drops. And he hasn't done anything phenomenal, but he hasn't done anything bad. He's done what's been asked of him so far. That was a really good touchdown catch on a really good route with, with not a ton of separation to make that play. He's a guy that maybe D- Brian Dable starts to work into this game plan more now that he can be trusted. And maybe is it can be an X factor in some of these games. You know, he, he's not getting a ton of targets. Maybe, you know, in a game where someone's trying to take away Diggs and Sanders, maybe he's the third guy. But let, let's give him that workload. Let's maybe start letting him be what we thought he was when we drafted him in that spot. So, you know, big ups to Dawson Knox. His stock is on the rise to, to anyone who held on to Dawson Knox stock after after last year. And and not even just Knox as a receiver. I think his blocking in the run game looks a lot better, which was another point of emphasis for that, that he, you know, in an area he needed to get better at uh, after last season. I think that his run blocking looks pretty good. And like you said, he's not dropping the ball. And, and, and that's always been the case with Dawson Knox. As long as he doesn't drop the football, he can be a pretty nice you know, piece in this offense because of the athleticism he brings to that position. So he's been, you know, he's been good. He's been, I'm, I've been happy with what I've seen from him. And if he can be this kind of a player for them moving throughout the season, I think it just adds a dimension to this offense that they just did not have last season because the tight end position for them gave him virtually nothing in the past game. So I think that's, that's really exciting to see. So Ryan, on the defensive side, because th- I mean, I think this has been the biggest storyline of, of this season so far outside of the offense you know, and their passing game kind of lagging a little bit. This defense, I know it's been against two, I'll say, bottom tier offensive lines with with Pittsburgh and Miami, but I mean, they look suffocating so far through two weeks. I I don't know about you, Ryan, but I've been really, really impressed with what I've seen from from Leslie Frazier and that side of the football. They look like a team who's invested a shit ton of uh, value in or assets into their defensive line the last two years. This is what they wanted to see last year. They didn't get it. Now they're getting it. I mean, look at Greg Rousseau, man. Two games. He's played two good games. He got most of this. He was the number. He had the highest percentage of snaps on the defensive line. In game two of his career, goes home to Miami, gets two sacks. A.J. Espinessa didn't show up on the stat sheet, but eight oh, pressures. Awesome. Eight pressures. Go If you haven't seen it yet, go to Chris Trapasso on Twitter, and he put he, – he, put a picture of a video of his TikTok where man, AJ Epinesa was taking dudes lunch monies on both sides of the line with multiple moves. Like he was, he was rushing past guys. He was pushy. He was bull rushing, just, just looking super, super developed, man. And, you know, we saw that in the preseason, like if they, that pressure can sustain, and we're going to talk about it once we bring Parker around in a couple minutes here that, you know, Washington's probably going to be the best offensive line they've played so far this year. So that would be a real test, but it's just really good to see c- contributions. You know, even like Ed Oliver has gone in the backfield. Every, everyone had at least uh, everyone had at least two pressures in this game from Star to Ed to, to Greg to uh, AJ. Everyone just stepped up and did their job, and it was just super, super impressive. I mean, hell, Ryan, even even Vernon Butler and like Zimmer, you know, were, were causing some problems. And, and and if you're getting that out of your backup D tackles, I mean, that is tremendous. And and again, like you said, this is what we thought we were going to see a year ago. Didn't have it. And finally, I mean, and, and not to mention, I do think that it, it could be a matter of time this season, Ryan, where Epinesa and Rousseau end up being your your starters on, on that D uh, and, and end up taking Hughes and Addison's roles because – I mean, when they come into the game, I mean, they just, for for lack of a better, you know, they, they, they just cause chaos, I mean, for the offensive lines. I mean, they just get, they get in the backfield, 
they get pressures, and they, they I think they work off each other really well because Epinesa is so quick and strong. He can get in the backfield, move the quarterback off a spot, and Rousseau is so good at just staying disciplined and, and, and just eventually getting to the quarterback. So it's it's been great. And on top of that, I mean, I think a guy that we're not talking about enough is Matt Milano through two weeks has been probably, I, I, I do believe, him and Taron Johnson have been maybe the best players in this Bills defense. They both are playing lights-out football. Honestly, I don't really through two weeks ryan i don't really see any weaknesses on this defense it's we started it's funny how this come full circle we started our show talking about hey hey maybe we don't need to resign matt milano linebacker is not a super high value position and you you could probably find similar or at least you know not an appreciable drop off with whatever you can get on the market or whatever you can get in the draft matt milano looks every penny worth of that contract just doing that the play that him and, and Taron Taron made on that fourth down play in the red zone was just elite high level stuff. Taron is playing like a man on a contract year. All the things that we love about Taron Johnson, he's doing plus covering, right? Taron Johnson, I always I joke around, you know, I group chats with my friends and I call him a skinny outside linebacker because dude can hit. Like that's never been a question. The play you know, the, there was multiple plays throughout both weeks where he's just coming down and laying the loot, uh, laying the lumber on dudes and dislodging balls, making big stops in the run game. That first sack on, on Tua, just doing, just being a really like he's playing Pro Bowl level football right now, and it's 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 showing and it's really elevating this defense. And even guys like Tremaine Edmonds, he's not showing up a ton on the stat sheet beside tackles, but if you go back and you watch some of the tape. He's dropping in the passing lanes. He's taking away. He's taking away passes from quarterbacks. He's doing. He's doing his job at a high level. There's no one on this defense right now that isn't doing their job well. Even even Levi, yeah, he's gonna get burned here and there. We know that. We know who Levi is, but he's still he, making he re- stops. Yeah he, yeah, he responded this week too. I thought he had, he played much better this week than he did week one too. I he, I thought before he got hurt, he was playing a very good game. And and Dane Jackson came in and played. Dane Jackson probably had the play of the game on that that last fourth down, yep. or the, I guess the second to last fourth down stop, yep. in of the game where he just comes down and goes low on the dude and makes a really clean tackle on fourth and one. Like th- there's just not enough really good things to say about this team. And now you know maybe the, the tra- way we can transition here is the next two quarterbacks we have coming into town are not Ryan. Not former Bills quarterbacks Ryan Fitzpatrick and Tyra Taylor like we thought. It's going to be Taylor Hinnicky, and I'm probably pronouncing this right. I'm going to ask Parker because I I read the name. I really don't know how to pronounce it. Um, Taylor Hinnicky and Davis Mills coming in the next two weeks, so it, they really have a chance to start teeing off in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. But also more weapons coming to town. That's true, and I and I think that that kind of segue is perfect here to bring in our our guest. Uh, we got coming on to the 5A5 Report podcast here, Parker Hamlet from Sideline Sports. Uh, first of all, Parker, thanks for coming on, and and how are you doing tonight, man? Doing absolutely fantastic, man. Really excited to talk this Sunday's matchup. Kind of revitalized our season, losing, as you said, former Bills quarterback Fitzpatrick. I, I know it's not exactly a nice thing to say, but coming off of a very, very impressive player performance against the GOAT, Tom Brady, Taylor Heineke, Heineke! That's the little thing the fans got going. Um, it, it definitely got some excitement in this fan base that there hasn't been for a very long time. But uh, where have you guys bought one of those Josh Allens? I would like one of those. <laughs> you know, the one I tweeted this out today from the show account that I think it's very appropriate that Heineke is the backup. What well, was with Fitzpatrick because he's got some of that same attitude that you know he's got an NFL caliber arm not a super special arm. He's got NFL caliber athleticism, not special athleticism, but you know what? He's going to make some three. He's going to try every single throw, whether he should or not. So he's going to make some sick throws like that, man, that throw at what the fourth quarter, I forgot who was in the corner of the end zone. That took some testicular fortitude to make that throw. Like you watch the sky, the, the sky can't have the perfect shot on that throw. He wasn't open. He just chucked it. Like that took some nuts. But you also have the throw where I was pissed because I had Washington minus three and a half, and he stares down the guy when they're trying to ice the game, and and the Giants come in and and make the pick. So, you know, I, he's really a unique talent. What are your what's your read right now on 
on Heineke and how far do you think he can take this team? Well, I was at FedEx Field for that Thursday night game. Uh, we were 4-0, or Daniel Jones was 4-0 to watch football. You said you guys said the monkey was on your back with the with the Dolphins. The monkey was kind of on our back with the New York Giants. And that that touchdown to Ricky Seal Jones, the back of the end zone, one touchdown, one catch for Ricky Seal Jones on the year kind of journeyman tight end. But Taylor put it exactly on the money and plays like that or, or why he's in the position that he's in now. Uh 13.7 completion percentage rate, uh, according to next gen stats and Nikki Javala. So that that's that that's an elite level throw made by Taylor Heineke. And something that you you kind of point out that I really like to bring up is that he has the gall to throw the ball in spots that most quarterbacks would not. He, he, he'll throw it in the middle of the field. He'll trust his guys. And he's built a rapport with, with guys in this receiving core. He's got guys like Terry McLaurin, who got pretty much a, a season high in targets, even though it'd be through two games. Ta- you know, Terry, you know, kind of a disrespected receiver in the National Football League. He, he hasn't exactly been able to get comfortable with anyone, but he seems to find this comfort with Taylor Heineke. And, you know, Logan Thomas, the star for the Washington football team, you know, former quarterback of Virginia Tech, said, you know, we never treated Taylor Heineke like he was the backup. You know, they, they never felt that way. And, you know, when asked this week, some people thought, you know, Taylor was a little bit gr- grandiose about it. He says, no, I should totally be the starter. He has that moxie. He brings that thing to the Washington football team. Now, whether that works out long term for the Washington football team, that is something to find out. That is something that we have yet to get a, a, a full sample of. But this is what Coach Rivera called a measuring stick game. Coach Rivera has a lot of respect, as do I, for what Sean McDermott has done in regards to the Buffalo Bills and turning around everything from a culture standpoint. Of course, they haven't been able to find the quarterback, but sometimes that doesn't exactly happen in ideal ways. And, you know, a guy that T- Taylor Heineke has been compared to a lot is one Kurt Warner. They share a lot of the same similar records. I feel like that's a, l- a little bit too early to tell all that, but, you know, the climate indeed right now heading into this matchup is certainly exciting. And I think these teams, while you guys are – what I would consider one of the top heavyweights of the AFC, the Washington football team is clawing their way and trying to make a name for themselves in a very mediocre division, of course, but looking to go back to back in that division for the first time since 2004. So exciting stuff here in the DMV. I think Washington did a really good job of doing what Buffalo did in building around build, basically building everything, but the quarterback. So when they find that quarterback, They can just slot him in and, you know, that's a really, you know, it's a good team around him. And, you know, starting with the offense, Scary Terry is really damn good. He's a sub four, four wide receiver. He can make about every single catch you want to make. He can play all over the field. And he is because he's in Washington. He's, he gets overlooked a lot because that offense was, was so pedestrian last year. Curtis Samuels is out this week again, right? He's on IR. He's a guy that I was really looking forward to see in this offense. But, you know, you have two really unique running backs back there, too. Antonio Gibson, a former wide receiver, J.K. McKissick, who who is also a guy with, with a really unique skill set that brings unique talent to this offense. Who's someone on this offense that you that whose people might not know that you think could really factor in to this game on Sunday? Of course, I'm I'm very high on the rookie from UNC, Deami Brown, but he's he's very young. Had it kind of an abysmal week one, week two, averaging 11 yards a catch, kind of working his way into the offense. But a guy you just mentioned, JD McKissick, you know, he was had 80 receptions as a running back last year for the Washington Football Team. Got a lot of targets, and after week one, it came up short against the against Los Angeles Chargers, and people were wondering where JD was. Well, JD made, in my opinion, the biggest play of the season so far for the Washington football team, that 56-yard pass completion from Taylor Heineke and that two-play two, two play scoring drive we were just talking about earlier. To me, it's just getting those those big plays. And you guys have a very stout linebacking core. You know, you're talking about Milano, Edmonds, A.J. Klein, who I think is a little bit underrated, someone that I don't think really universally gets a lot of respect, but every team he's been on, he's always done his part and done it well. I, I think Washington needs to use its speed because, like I said, the Buffalo Bills, uh, they, they are close to a finished product. They have built a culture under Sean McDermott. I really thought they were they were going to come out of the AFC last year. I was a firm in it. I, it. I think if there's a team that is going to defeat the Kansas City Chiefs, it is going to be the Buffalo Bills. But I really like J.D. McKissick in this matchup because outside of Edmonds, I don't feel like a lot of those linebackers bring a lot of speed. And, and you can utilize J.D. As, as a mismatch in a lot of those cases because that secondary, man – Micah Hyde, Jordan Boyer, Tredavious White, th- th- those guys are dangerous. Terry McLaurin came out today and said Tredavious White is the best man corner he's played against in the National Football League, and it- it's going to be it- – I'm getting my popcorn ready. I'm ready to see those two square off on Sunday. 
And Parker, how about how about the Washington defensive line? Because I know a lot of Bills fans are really concerned about that matchup against the Bills offensive line going to this game because the only taste the Bills have had against an elite front was against the Steelers, and they struggled a lot. I mean, Allen was under pressure all game. Obviously, going into the season, that D-line was really hyped up after the year they had in 2020. Have they so far kind of lived up to the expectations? Like, what have you seen from that from that unit that's just first-round picks galore? First round, yeah, first round picks galore is definitely the best way to put it. And I want to p- put a key emphasis on one word you said, and that is hype. Because it certainly seems so far through the 2021 season to be a lot of hype. They have not quite lived up to that. They did not get to Justin Herbert very often in that week one matchup. Of course, we're still early in the season. Week two against a very, I'd say, bottom five offensive line in New York. I they, 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 they got to the quarterback. You know, Jonathan Allen signed an extension in the offseason, just another Alabama guy. They're locking up for that defensive line. They're not going to be able to keep everybody, but they're locking up those core pieces. Jonathan Allen leading us with three sacks. Uh, Chase, no sacks in the year, year yet. Got a pass deflection. Uh, if you're a PFF guy, he's gotten the hell pressures. Uh, as far as the other guys on the defensive line, I Montez Sweat is a very underrated pass rusher in the National Football League. Um, someone that the watch football team traded up for in the 2019 first round. Had a hard condition. A lot of teams were – very afraid to take a gamble on him, but the athleticism and speed he brings. If there is a team in the National Football League that will be able to keep Josh Allen in the pocket, it is going to be the Washington football team. It does not get more athletic than Montez Sweat and Chase Young on the outsides. But a very big growing frustration with this coaching staff is that a lot of guys are just not doing their assignments, and they've been in the film room. They've been trying to check up on that kind of stuff. Jack Del Rio defenses historically get better as the year goes on. And like I said, this is a great measuring stick for this Washington football team defense. It, when it comes to athleticism, there aren't many quarterbacks can do what Josh Allen can do. And I'm I'm very much looking forward to seeing how the defense fares against an elite quarterback, quarterback like Allen after how they played against Herbert. I mean, it was a very close game, but the defense still has a lot of lo- work left to do. When you look at ways Buffalo has failed, it's been because of their issues in the interior defensive line. John Feliciano, his gotten his ass kicked by Chris Jones, has gotten his ass kicked by Cam Hayward. He is someone you could take advantage of. And, you know, it, one of the things that really irked me after that Pittsburgh game was people say, well, Josh has figured out. Josh has figured out. Like, no, if you get interior pressure and you get pressure with four, you're going to beat any quarterback, whether it's Tom Brady, whether it's Joe Montana, whether it's anyone. And Jonathan Allen, I love Jonathan Allen. He's a hell, hell of a player. And even the guys next, Deron Payne's not a bad player. Tim, Ioannidis, Tim Settle, all yeah, of them. is good too. Ioannidis, even even Tim Settle's a guy who can hold his own out there. Like it, it's it's a deep line, and you know it, they can make it a long day for John Feliciano. And if he does not come out ready to play, and Josh has to run around, we've seen what that looks like for this offense. So when you start thinking about you know how you know it, it's Vegas has this at nine and a half, right? And you start thinking about ways that Washington could find an advantage and start to tip the scales. If they can get pressure and they can get pressure early and, and get Allen off his spots, because we've seen with Allen one, you know, I think something you can knock him on is once shit starts going wrong, it, it waterfalls and, and, and it really starts cast and it really starts kind of building up on each other. They can get the Allen early and often be, through Tim Settle, through Chase Young, through Montez Sweat with four, you know, the secondary I know hasn't played spectacular, but if they can get with four and, and force Allen to, to leave the pocket, it, it could be a lot closer game that I think Vegas is anticipating. I mean, leaving the pocket, I you know, from my experiences watching Josh Allen, he's made some of his best plays outside of the pocket, you know, and, and w- with his legs, man, you know, 80 rushing yards over the last two weeks for Josh Allen. I just he's he's everything you want in a franchise quarterback. Very raw coming out of Wyoming. I, w- I was not very high on him, but it, it, if the Buffalo Bills more of a of a ball control team, you know, Devin Singletary averaging six point five yards per carry right now, really coming into his own. You got that that running back core also with Zach Moss, you know, with his availability kind of being an issue. And not only that, but but Josh Allen gets the ball around to all of his playmakers. You got twenty one targets to Diggs, seventeen to Beasley, fourteen to Emmanuel Sanders. And might add, Emmanuel Sanders was a very underrated pickup. For the Buffalo Bills, he's kind of a dormant deep threat. You know, sometimes you forget he's there, but he can bust the game wide open on a moment's notice. This was a team that knows that they were a couple plays away from being in the Super Bowl last year. They kept their main core. They went out and got a couple of playmakers. They maintained, and they know that they can be right back in the dance again 
it's all about getting to that final part of the season for the Buffalo Bills. And like I said, I consider them one of the heavyweights of the National Football League. And like you said, if the Watch Football team wants a chance in this game, they are going to have to make Josh comfortable. That, that That's definitely for damn sure. But Josh Allen definitely – I, I, people are going to sit here and tell you that, you know, he's having a rough start to the season. I, I said the watch football team defense gets better as time goes. I really do feel like Josh Allen's one of those quarterbacks that gets better as the season goes on as well. Now, do you have a player who you draft? Mitch, I know when we were doing our pre-draft shows, was really high on Jamin Davis as we kind of thought about maybe Matt Bellano leaving or the long-term future of, of Tremaine Edmonds. And Jamaine Davis was a really unique talent out of Kentucky. And, you know, I think it raised a little bit of eyebrows of him going in the first round like he did. But, the, you know, I watched pretty extensively that the game last week and he flashed. He's doing a lot of good things for a guy who was a one year starter in Kentucky. What have you guys seen out of Jermaine Davis? And is he is he someone that is already a key part of this defense? I feel like it's almost fate that you would bring this up. I actually got a lot of backlash <laughs> by Washington football team Twitter for my take on Jamin Davis. I am not very high on how he plays the run. He, he looks very small in the run game, uh, has a hard time getting past guys, you know, that are just at that second, third level. Once the run game gets there, he's just not exactly an excellent tackle. His anticipation is next level. His athleticism is next level. I could definitely see him fitting on a team like the Buffalo Bills. Uh, I, I, as far as the committee was concerned, I, no one foresaw Jamin Davis being a first round draft pick. And that seemed to be the general consensus. And you said that very nicely. And I appreciate it. <laughs> I was very critical, very critical of the Washington football team, not selecting a quarterback in the first round. And I was very critical of Jamin Davis. Um, I, I, I was very high on Jeremiah Owusu koromoa out, out of Notre Dame and a couple other guys. I feel like they could have brought just as much, if not more to the Washington football team. But Ron Rivera is a very big fan of the military type of kids. He's very hard-nosed. Unlike Michael Parsons, he knows where to line up on the football field. Very smart. Had kind of a rough turn. I'm not going to lie to you. Kind of why he's getting some limited snaps right now. But the sky is the limit. It's a very high PFF grade. And no matter how you feel about PFF, that's a running gag on my show as well. But <laughs> overall, I think Jamin Davis in the long term is going to be a very good pick for the Washington football team. He brings what Tremaine Edmond does to the Buffalo Bills defense, and that's the speed and athleticism at linebacker that you need to cover some of these next level tight ends in the national football league. So I, I, I was not excited about Jamin Davis, but he, he, he is naturally progressing as the season goes. And like you said, had a very good showing week two. And Parker, like in, in your opinion, like when you're looking at this matchup between, you know, Buffalo's offense and, and Washington's defense, like what is as from the Washington football team perspective, like you think the scariest thing going into this game, like what, what, what do you have like kind of circled in red that like, they got to take care of this or, or this could be a tough one for us. That that's a phenomenal question. And I remember I was watching you guys playoff game a couple years back. I was sitting around with my family drinking some beer, uh, playing the Houston Texans and I'm watching Josh Allen absolutely run for his life. And I I'm itching to tell the story and go on a show and talk about it. And I was just sitting there, you know, I, I think he, his number one was Foster at the time. He had absolutely no one to throw to. And I'm a firm believer, especially when I talk about teams like the Baltimore Ravens, you got to go get this guy a playmaker. You got to go get him somebody special. You got to go get somebody their tried and true number one receiver. And watch the football team fans, you know, due to the Maryland connection and, and, and some local, local boy stuff, were very high on Stephon Diggs. There were a couple rumors that he was going to get traded to the DMV. Fans were very high on it. Worked out Dwayne Haskins some back in 2019, 2020. I am very, very high on Stephon Diggs. In my opinion, he's the best route runner in the National Football League. Uh, Fred Smoot, former player for the Washington football team, said that him and Terry McLaurin are, are two of the best, pretty much the two best route runners in the National Football League. Some people say it's a little audacious, but I, I can't disagree with that sentiment. But when it comes to tears, man, Stephon Diggs is on another level, man. He was very underappreciated in Minnesota. And just the relationship, I mean, I, I don't have to tell you guys this relationship <laughs> built with Josh Allen, man. It's really something special. He's got that T.O. energy. That, that's my quarterback. And th that, that's the kind of relationship that you want between a quarter, your franchise quarterback and your number one wide receiver. I, I'm always going to circle Stephon Diggs, man. William Jackson the third. You know, we brought him in free agency, was a lockdown corner for the Cincinnati Bengals, but he looked very human against Darius Slayton, Kenny Galladay. And in my opinion, Stephon Diggs is, is on a tier above those kind of guys. And not only that, but like we were talking about earlier, guys, that supporting cast, you know, you got Emmanuel Sanders, Cole Beasley. You, you catch Stephon Diggs on a certain look, and he's going to absolutely embarrass whoever's lined up in front of him. So Stephon Diggs is always a guy that, in my opinion, can, can break games for whoever he's lined up for. A pros to nothing. 
you know, my fiance is a JMU alum. So we were a little heartbroken to see uh, Jimmy Moreland get cut this season. We're big <laughs> Jimmy Moreland. I was too. We're big Jimmy Moreland fans in our household. But, you know, I'm, I'm glad you're talking about playmakers because, you know, the people, everyone knows Terry McLaurin, but one person that Bill's Mafia is, is very familiar with is Logan Thomas. And a guy who I think Buffalo was the first team he that he was a tight end for. Yes, and he, he, he didn't do a whole lot for us. He had a couple of years, had a couple of touchdown passes, and and went on his I think he was here for the first year, McDermott, then went on to Detroit and finally at age 30 had a breakout year last year with a thousand yards. And I think that's a guy when you talk about X factors, Buffalo gets gashed by tight ends. We talked about, they get faster speed and they get bashed gashed with tight ends. Gaskin did nothing against new England week one. And, you know, Brissett eats most of his offense. What was throwing to Gasicki in the Miami game. We get eight by eight by Travis Kelsey. This is a team that at times can struggle with tight ends. And I don't know if it's just the way we play defense or if, if it's the guys we have in the middle or what the deal is, but, How's Logan Thomas been for this year? What? How do they use Logan Thomas? Is he someone that that you know is the number two option on this team after Terry McLaurin? You know, I, I'm really glad you brought up his tenure in Buffalo. He also had a, a very small tenure with the Detroit Lions at the home game in 2019 when he literally shattered Ryan Kerrigan's helmet on a block. You know, it's never been because of a lack of effort with Logan Thomas. He's always had the size. He's always had the ability. You know, me growing up in Virginia, I, I, I've been to a lot of Virginia Tech games when he was a starting quarterback, and he's always had the size. He's always had the look to, to be a professional athlete. He finally found his niche, and I credit that a lot to the coaching staff. You know, we sit here and talk about Sean McDermott and, and his staff and how well of a, a team and culture they've built. Pete Hayner is just a, a tight end guru for the Washington football team. Logan came in, he worked hard, he put his hand in the dirt, and he maximized the opportunities that he got. And he he is the red zone target outside of Terry McLaurin. And, you know, he had one score in week one. He also, a lot like Terry, has built a hell of a, of a rapport with Taylor Heineke. You know, it, it, it's been a hell of a quarterback carousel here as a Washington football team fan, to say the least. But Logan Thomas has always found a way to find pay dirt. And you're definitely right. You wouldn't think with the athleticism with Tremaine Edmonds in the middle of the field that they would have a problem covering tight ends. You know, Tremaine is a next-level athlete. It's definitely wouldn't expect that. But that is a statistic that jumps out on paper. But Logan's always been a one-touchdown every four games kind of guy. But he always goes up and gets it. People are very critical of, uh, of Taylor's ball placement sometimes. But every time Taylor looks to Logan, he puts it to where only Logan Thomas can get it. And you, you're right. that He could be a huge X factor in the, in the game this Sunday for sure. I got to ask you a little bit, Parker, too, because a guy that I really like is, is Antonio Gibson. I think he's turning into one of the more like underrated running backs in the National Football League because I think his skill set is just so like dynamic. And, you know, again, not trying to kind of just throw, you know, just talk about all what the Bills defense has struggled with traditionally, but they have had some games where they get gashed, uh, you know, in the run game and get kind of run over. Is that kind of ultimately like the strength of this Washington football team offense? Is it kind of go through Gibson? And do you think that that is – maybe what Washington looks to do in this game. It, that's a great point, Mitch. I, I, I tweeted during the offseason that the Washington football team will live and die by Antonio Gibson in 2021. You know, coming out of Memphis, third-round draft pick, um, he, former wide receiver, now running back, still kind of makes some acclimations to the position change, but, man, is he – he has come a very long way in a very short amount of time. Of course, the Christian McCaffrey comparisons, I was never a big fan of that just because Ron Rivera was a coach for the Carolina Panthers at one point. Christian McCaffrey played football there. does not mean that should be a comparison. Antonio Gibson is a Christian McCaffrey is Christian McCaffrey. Antonio Gibson has very favorable size. Uh, my biggest concern with Antonio Gibson in regards to his long-term future of the Washington football team is ball security. He single-handedly, I hate to blame it all on one guy, cost us that week one victory against the Chargers, pins us back on our own 10-yard line, kind of carrying the ball like a loaf of bread. But when he gets the ball in open field, it's kind of hard to not compare him to guys like Christian McCaffrey. He looks explosive, looks looks like a wide receiver with the ball in his hands, you know, once he gets that opportunity in open field and a lot more targets to start off this season than last season but just as a ball carrier in general that first move he makes is always vicious he's learned to become very patient his anticipation is is starting to become elite level you know him and Devin Singletary you know Gibson's at 159 yards on season Singletary's at 154 you know these two guys have off to very hot starts to, to start off the 2021 season and Antonio Gibson certainly brings a lot to the offense I was kind of worried coming into the season guys not gonna lie I had a turf toe injury benching for that wild card game Got to operate on the offseason. 
kind of worried that that that, that uh, turf toe was going to linger. Seems to not be the case, and he seems to be that bell cow back this coaching staff's hoping he was going to be. So, I, like I said, we're going to live and die by, a, a, as we call him, the weapon of 21, that's for sure. Now, one more position group that, that I'm really curious about, and we talked about this a little bit as we segued, that – and I that I kind of want to highlight is the offensive line. This is going to be the best offensive line that I think the Bills have played all season. Um, For sure. You know, part and I think large part everyone knows Brandon Scherf, all all pro, all you know, all world guard. How's the rest of that offensive line that people might know? I know Charles Leno your left tackle, and you know, it it I you guys have an NFL quality line. How how do you guys feel about your line play through two through two games here? It's a very controversial ar- array of characters. Of course, we departed uh, with Morgan Moses, who, who joined your division recently. Uh, he was kind of an underappreciated locker room leader. Uh, he was a very big Gruden guy. There's a lot of locker room changes that Rivera brought, and Rivera was Rivera is a very no no guy. Uh, shipped Morgan out, drafted Samuel Cosme, who looks very mediocre in, in the past pro. But in the run game, he is a, a mauler, a lot like the guy right beside him, Brandon Sheriff, all pro that you guys were speaking of. Contract year for him, $18 million a guard. Certainly isn't something that a lot of general managers like, but he's an all pro. He brings it absolutely every season. It's always been availability for Brandon Sheriff. That's always been the biggest thing for him. Uh, center, Chase Ruye, late round draft pick. I'm actually friends with his grandfather. Chase has always played uh, uh, above and beyond his expectations. He has become that general, that sort of Jason Kelsey type. In, in the middle of the Washington football team offense, offensive line. And you know, he's recently got a contract as well. So we got him locked up, up, locked up for the, you know, foreseeable future left guard, got a kind of a different array of characters there. We got Wes Schweitzer, Sadiq Charles. I mean, we, we got all kinds of guys moving out. Eric flowers, who was a very good story for, for the Miami dolphins last year. He, he left the Washington football team, revitalized his career. As you guys know, he was left tackle for the New York Giants. Didn't quite work out. Position change. Cut, plays with us. 2019 goes, gets his payday with Miami. Get him back for a seventh-round pick, and he's looked absolutely amazing ever since he's been back on the Washington football team. And, you know, left tackle, there's some concerns there as well. You know, Charles kind of moved from guard to tack. Cornelius Lucas, Charles Leno Jr., who, who was a Pro Bowl talent for the Chicago Bears at one point left tackle, but that was a very long time ago. <laughs> but we, we can make do with what we have, and when this unit's gelling, they are gelling well. I definitely agree this is probably the best offensive line that the Buffalo Bills defensive lines face up at this point. But when you got guys like Ed Oliver, Sardu Lulele, uh, AJ Espinosa, all, all those guys, I think that they're going to – I, I think they're going to have a favorable matchup Sunday. I, I, I got to tell you guys, this, this Buffalo Bills defense is legit, <laughs> and anyone who's saying otherwise is not watching these games on Sunday. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. I, I, I think that that's going to kind of be what it comes down to. It What this game comes down to it is, is I think, that Buffalo offensive line versus the Washington defensive line because, you know, I think that – Washington's offensive line, you know what they have, and they've been battle tested, I think, so far playing uh, Los Angeles, who I think has a pretty good defense. And then Washington, or in New York, who had a very uh, top notch defense a season ago. So, next we're going to, I, really I, good. I, I, yes, absolutely. Yes. So I think for, from a Bills fan's perspective, we're going to really see what this defensive line is made of because they've looked great through two weeks. But again, they've, they've kind of played nobody, to be honest. I mean, Pittsburgh got arguably the worst D line of football. Um, and, and Miami's not much better. So Dolphins I think that's look like be... the little brother in the division. That's for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Which, Hey, we're, oh, we're never, you know, which we're happy with obviously, but they I think that's really... for his safety. <laughs> for his safety. Oh yeah, man. I mean, yeah, it was, it was a rough go for them, but we're going to, I think from Bill's we're going to really see what, what, what this D line is made up of. And, and, and really if all the assets that have been poured in, like Ryan mentioned earlier, that we've been poured into this D line with the money and the draft pick, similar to kind of what Washington has done. We're going to really see if, if it's what we think it is, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. No, go ahead. Yeah. Like I said, Sean McDermott, Ron Rivera are, are very close, very similar blueprints. You know, they work hand in hand, make a lot of the same, you know, decisions. And, and like I said, man, the Buffalo Bills, in my opinion, were a couple plays away. For being in the Super Bowl last year, you know, I, Josh Allen I was a very big advocate for him being, being on the cover of Madden. I know that's not exactly football talk, but <laughs> Josh Allen is that kind of guy for this franchise. He, he really brings everybody together, and it's really nice to see a team be patient, build around a quarterback, Baltimore, and really believe in him and be patient with him. And Josh Allen, you know, people roll their eyes at that extension. I, I see some Washington football team fans, I'm not even going to lie to you, uh, saying, oh, he hasn't lived up to that extension so far. 
Josh Allen can 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 score six points on a moment's notice. He has the arm, he has the athleticism, and he has the playmakers. It's just all piecing it together and getting to that upper tier in the AFC. And I, I think he's going to have a ring on his hand a lot sooner than people think. And, and on that note, Mitch, do we want to get to some score predictions? Let's do it. This, yeah, let's do it this week. I, I think we got to start with you know with our guest Parker. Like you know, well, let's let's send it to you. What what is your prediction for the score? Who's winning and and, and what happens in this one? I take the spread. Uh, when I checked earlier today, it was minus 7.5. Uh, I'll take the over. Uh, it's uh, 40, over under is 44.5. I got the Bills winning 25 21. I, I, I think that they're going to force Taylor Heineke out of the spot. They're going to make him very uncomfortable. I think that the Washington football team is going to score points, and this is going to be a highly contested game. But I think the Bills are going to squeak this one out. I think it's going to be very physical. I think both defenses are going to show up. I don't see either offense having exactly a showcase day, putting up 30 points. I think it's going to be a very well coached defensive football game, and I have the in and out 25 21. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to go similar. I'm, I'm actually glad that line shifted down a little bit because I thought what it opened up as was a lot. I think that's a lot more indicative of what type of game it was. I think it's going to be a game where Buffalo is never going to really put them away. I think it's going to be our reach Agreed. most of the game. Um, but I just, I, 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 I like what you said to open the show that, you know, my, they're almost Washington at this point, almost kind of like a diet Buffalo. And if they get their quarterback, if maybe high Nick, Hannah Kennedy takes that step, you know, they do become that team, but you know, but still talented team, deep team, uh, Buffalo wins 27, 20. I like it. I, I, I'm not to sound like a broken record, but I agree with you guys. Like I, I think the spread initially was way too high for this game. I think it was kind of disrespectful to Washington because I really do feel like that Washington could be, is probably the best team in the NFC East. And that, you know, from what we saw a season ago, they can play with, with some big players. Um, I, I think, you know, I got a funny feeling this game is going to be kind of low scoring. I think that both defenses in this game are really freaking legit. And that, both offenses kind of have some question marks going on right now. Again, like Heineke, like we've only seen him really play two and a half games as the starting quarterback for Washington. And it has looked good, but again, we don't, I, I still don't think we hundred percent know what he is. And then again, this bill's passing offense has just been a little off to start the season so far. So I actually have, I do have the bills winning this game just because it is home in Buffalo. And I think that does kind of come into play with the, with the, with the crowd noise in the environment, but I have, I have Buffalo winning this game 21, uh, 17. Bills Mafia, crazy man. That 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 <laughs> I I saw Chris Collins were said on Sunday Night Football that home field advantage is back in the National Football League, and I, I <laughs> Buffalo is not a place I would want to play a opposing <laughs> quarterback. I'll tell you that much right now. The, the players are about as crazy as their fans are. But you guys seem pretty tame. You have the, the division champ shirt on as well. Are we, yeah, I, I noticed that. I I noticed that as I was recording, and I, you know I, I gotta thank you because as I was going into this show. I was like, fuck, man, I'm definitely going to say Washington Redskins at some point. But you kept saying Washington football team and not just Washington, which which helped center me because I was like, I'm def- I am because I still call the charge or uh, the Rams St. Louis and and the and the Chargers San Diego. So I was like, I'm definitely going to say it. I'm Weird. definitely going to say it. But you kept saying football team. So I was like, all right, that's going to keep me from saying saying uh, well, saying Ryan. the other one. You, you know, I got to ask you now, first of all, in, in regards to the, the entire rebranding thing. I'm a big WFT guy. I, you know, I, I I've talked to the I, president. Of, I think of the it's Washington great. Team. I, I love it. The marketing approach that they've taken WFT football team. It, I, I think it's great. If they stick with that, I would be, it, I would be absolutely ecstatic if that's what they went with. Uh, there are a couple general names that are in the consensus as far as what they're going to go with next. It's going to be some type of iteration of wolf where the red wolves are just wolves in general. And I want to get you guys thoughts on the rebrand and, you guys have a particular favorite? I, I gotta ask while I'm here. Yeah, I, go ahead, Mitch. You know when they when they first came out with the, with the Washington football team, like I mean, I clowned it like everybody else because like course, what, that that's not a name like they're the football team like what? But no, it, it has grown on me. Like I I, I actually do think it's kind of cool. Um, that being said, though, and maybe like I mean again, who knows? This is what will happen. But but when people were making concepts for the Red Wolves, I think was like the name that's been tossed around. Like those did look pretty, pretty awesome. And I think it would be kind of cool to have and it's the fan uh, favorite. That, wow, yeah, I think that would be a cool name. So I think if they go in either one of those two, two directions, I think you go Red Wolves, you can make it kind of futuristic and cool football team, keep it kind of old school. I think, I think either way you're, you're setting, you're setting, you know, and, and doing and looking good. So I, I I'm, I'm happy with 
either direction. But yeah, the football team grew on me, man. I really thought it was so it was really Mitch, stupid, but I I, I kind of like it. Mitch sounds like he's Team Red Wolves. <laughs> Well, the uh, numbers, I'm a little Team the, Red Wolves, but, but the, I do like football team. Don't get me wrong. The, okay. numbers on, the numbers on the helmet. I mean, I think the numbers on the helmet are cool. Like, they ended up oh, being like, a, like a super awesome. kind of just like clean look. And like, I don't know, there's something that like just seeing W, like WFT, it's kind of like it's, it's like it's, it's, it's so easy it's to got, type too. Like, it just, it just rolls yeah. off the tongue well. You it's, know what yeah. I mean? It, it's very easy, much recognizable. You know, I think Red Wolves, I mean, I, from the beginning, like I'm, I was a, one of my, you know, one of my majors in college was history. So I like, I really thought the Red Tails was a good name. I know, I don't know if that one guy is still uh, copyright squatting on them. Oh, he but, is, he is. It's, it's not <laughs> much available, but he is. <laughs> but, you know, I, I thought that was a really cool one. I think there's a lot of neat history there. I've seen the mock-ups for Red Wolves. Um, what's the one? One of the radio get shows here a week or two ago was saying Washington president. I thought that was dumb. So if you're not gonna yeah, do if if someone was if you're gonna do if you're gonna do uh, if you're not gonna do red tails, I think red wolves is the next next best option. And I, you know I, I love this matchup this week because, like I said, you guys are poised to win a Super Bowl. I, I I'll 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 rest on that. That that is my expectation for the Buffalo Bills for this season. I think. Another shot at Patrick Mahomes and Kansas City Chiefs, no matter where they're playing. I, I think they give them a fair shake and they possibly win. It, it really is kind of a, a, a all the, this year about the watch football team is all about transition. You know, we're going to next year, we're going to rock a new name. You know, we're not there yet. But like I said, this is a very big measuring stick game against one of the NFL's elite teams. And I think the watch football team is going to fare a lot better than people think. I'm, I'm definitely excited to watch the game. And I, I've definitely had a blast talking to you guys about it. That's for sure. Yeah. And I think you guys, I mean, you guys got the best coaching staff by far in the league in at least in the league in the conference in the division excuse me um in the division mike mccarthy is mike mccarthy <laughs> joe judge yeah. doesn't understand what, how challenges work and <laughs> nick casari hey. nick casari plays uh brock paper scissors with his draft oh prospects so and i it's mean such a mess doug Pedersen was a, <laughs> was a higher pedigree man and, and coach brought a super bowl to that city and they chose Carson Wentz is over there breaking both of his ankles. <laughs> over him. It absolutely blew my mind. I, I still can't get over that. But, hey, good for the WFT, good for the watch football team. And, you know, when I go around kind of saying that I say that we're the favorites, it's not because I'm a content creator. It's not because I'm heavily involved. It's mainly because it's run by adults. And that's something that I know Bills fans can relate to as well. And that translates to success. So yep. I had him winning. Excited. So before you go, Parker, plug yourself. Let us know where everyone can mm-hmm. find you. Oh yeah, I appreciate you guys so much, man. It's always fun going on other shows, talking to talking to the enemy. You know, <laughs> that's something I've always enjoyed. You know, I, I love talking Burgundy and Gold, but I watch football in general, and I just love talking with all different kinds of people. So once again, thank you for having me on. And I am the head of NFL operations at the Sideline Sports Network. Uh, so to anyone listening, to this, if you or anyone you know is interested in covering their favorite sports franchise for one of the fastest rising sport networks in the country, email me at sidelines underscore wft at gmail.com. Of course, audio, you can find Sidelines Washington Podcast, Spotify, Apple, pick your poison, leave a rating, review, subscribe. Uh, even if the review is bad, I don't care. Let us YouTube, subscribe, turn on notifications. You can find us on there. Also, all social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Linktree, and all bios. And once again, you know, Mitch Ryan, it was a pleasure coming up here and chopping up with you guys. And don't be, don't beat us up too bad. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Parker, it was a pleasure to have you on. And, and you're always welcome back. And if there's ever any future... Uh, battles between Buffalo and Washington. So thanks for, for coming on Super Bowl. Sounds good. <laughs> exactly. There we go. So uh, that about does it here for the five, eight, five report. Uh, we really appreciate you guys listening. And again, you can find us at five, eight, five report on Twitter and Instagram and uh, find us on Spotify, Apple, wherever you listen to your podcast, we are all there. Uh, and we'll have the video dropping on Saturday afternoon of this podcast version um and with that being said please listen to everything else in the buffalo fanatics network whether it's podcast articles youtube whatever it might be uh, everyone's really grinding now and and things are getting exciting as we really sort of get into the swings of things here in this nfl season so for uh, ryan sullivan i'm mitch broder thank you so much for listening and have a great